Amen. One uh, other quick announcement I'd like to make before I get into the message today, because uh, it's happening on a Wednesday night, not on Sunday afternoon as I've been doing it before, but I am offering a membership class, and it's this Wednesday from 6 to 8.30. It's a class again that if you're interested in either in finding out more about the church or possibly joining as a member, come and we talk about who Jesus is and what it means to be a disciple and talk about things about the United Methodist Church as a whole and then this local church and how God is using Fern Creek United Methodist Church. So uh, come out to that, sign up. There is a sign up for that uh, outside on the uh, welcome table. Now we're going to keep getting deeper into the uh, book of James. It seems like the deeper you get, uh, the more he starts meddling. Uh, I remember one time preaching on this topic of the tongue, and, and, and one of the ladies in the, in, the, in the study, it was a study we were doing, she said, uh, Brother Jim, you've gone from preaching to meddling now as you're talking about this subject, and, I, and we might feel that way because it's the topic of taming the tongue. Um, and last night, again, or sometime yesterday, it might have been the day before, Lynn and Rose, they said, Jim, do you have any particular songs in mind? about, uh, and by the way, that should be, for, that'll be James, if you see up there, it's just James chapter 3 we'll be looking at on this one, but, uh, and I said, well, uh, you know, they were struggling coming up with songs, you know, about the tongue or gossip and those kind of things, and, and I was struggling with coming up a song, and, uh, and, you know, I started thinking about that. Maybe this hits too close to home for all songwriters, too, you know, I mean, this is kind of hitting close to home. They got to sing about something they struggle with. Um, but it's, it'll probably hit all of us is the bottom line. Um, and that, that's just a part of who we are in our struggles. But uh, hear, hear the reading of James chapter 3. He'll begin with one topic just for a couple of verses, and then he moves into the broader topic of the, this whole idea of the tongue. Now, many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and all and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire and itself can, and excuse me, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, and reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray, come, come Holy Spirit. For I know this is a struggle probably every single one of us will have this morning that, that James speaks of. And it was a struggle for him as well. And so we pray, come and help us to guard our mouths and help us to put a tight rein on our own tongues. But speak to us deeply. And not only do we need the tight rein, on tongues that might say things that, that hurt, but that we might have loose tongues to sing praises to you and to encourage people with. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, James is at it again, tackling another tough subject, one that I'm sure will make all of us squirm just a little, if not more. How to try to control the hardest thing to control in our lives as Christians. And that's our tongues. These tongues of ours that can sing praises to the Lord on a Sunday morning and can get quite snippy with the waiter at the restaurant 30 minutes later. These tongues that can give thanks to folks who think like us and rip apart someone who doesn't. 
These tongues that can say encouraging words to a child on one hand, but slay the reputation of a peer by either dropping innuendos or passing on stories. And that's why in the outline in the bulletin, I put James 3.2 at the top of the outline. For no matter whether the subject is about being an effective teacher for, for the Lord, or being an effective pastor or leader, or simply about trying to control these tongues of ours, let us remember we all, underline that word all, stumble in many ways. And by the way, the, the, the context of that is present tense. Kind of like we're going to struggle in this. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, now women, we're not going to let you off the hook here today. You might be saying, yeah, I know that these men say a lot of dumb things sometimes. And it's speaking to men, but it's speaking to all of us. And that's why I always say, if anyone is never involved in what he or she says, he or she is a perfect man or woman, able to check his whole body, or to keep his whole body in check. Find me a person who doesn't sin with their tongue or their mouth, and I'll show you a person who doesn't sin, <laughs> is basically what it's saying. Because the sin of the tongue is the easiest is to fall into. Someone is gossiping at work, and the next thing you know, a whole bunch of people are listening to our story. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> I would have said someone is gossiping at work and suddenly I find myself joining in their story. But maybe that someone just happens to be us who has started that story. Now up to this point in his letter, James has been addressing the recipients of his letter by using the word you in the first two chapters. For example, verse 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. He's just giving us some good guideline. Ask God. Do that. But in this passage, he uses the word we no fewer than four times, identifying, I believe, with two things. One, he is a teacher himself. Two, he's a leader of the church as well. He was a preacher too. He was doing all of those things things as well. And secondly, he probably struggled with his sin also. We. And there's something about that, that in this capacity, this is a passage about we today. He first of all wants to address, though, a topic that he just takes a couple of verses really to address, and then he moves into a more, more general thing, I think, for, for all of us, but he addresses the fact of being a teacher. Now, in this case, he's talking about, obviously, teaching in the church or maybe preaching in the church or being a leader as well. And basically, what he's going to encourage in this first verse is that being a teacher, leader, brings greater responsibility and greater accountability to whoever will take up that task. And so he says the words, and you have to listen to James closely. Verse 3, 1, not many of you should, and what's the word? Should presume. Now we're going to talk about to be teachers. By the way, I know Col uh, 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 Col you're over there, just culture's over there just saying, hold it, I need teachers, right? <laughs> well, we need preachers as well today. But hear what James really means by this word presume. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Again, with James, you have to hear the tone in which he says something and the tone is this, not many of us should presume. In other words, don't be presumptuous about it. Don't be nonchalant about teaching. Don't take this great responsibility lightly, is basically what he's saying. In the New Testament times, apostles and prophets travel, but teachers were basically located within those local places and churches. And preachers as well. In James's time, a teacher had the all-inspiring responsibility to put a stamp of faith and knowledge on those who were entering the church as new Christians. We know that in this time, James was facing those who were false teachers, spreading all kinds of heresy. And that's why he's saying this is such an important task to be a teacher. He also recognized that there were teachers who taught but didn't live the faith out. And Paul recognized that as well in Romans 2, 21, 22. He writes, you who teach others, do you teach yourself? 
Do you teach yourself? Are you taking what you're saying into your own life, you might say? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Or you who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Um, in uh, Celebrate Recovery, we're moving into uh, the inventory time. This whole second book from, from uh, Lesson 7 through 11 is how to do your inventory and those kind of things. And one of the things that it mentions is about a sponsor or accountability partner that we all need someone that will kind of walk beside us as we're going through this part of the journey. But I notice in the teaching literature about finding a sponsor, and this is true in AA and other places, one of the things it says, you know, there, here's five or six good things to look for in a sponsor, that you, someone you can trust, you know, with your life and all you want to tell them. And it says, one of the things it says, does this person not only know the 12 steps, are they living the 12 steps? And that's essential and key for someone. A lot of people, we can talk the talk, but is that person literally living that life as well? And this is part of the challenge of what James is saying. So what would James say? Take the teaching responsibility seriously is what he's saying. In other words, Paul's advice to Timothy was this, study to show yourself to prove. And so as teachers, man, let, as preachers, as those who are leaders, let's be in the Word. Let's study. Let's dig into it. Let's get excited. You know, about, that's what he's saying about teaching. And then secondly, we have to be humble as teachers. We must always realize that we are learners and the first place we go, even before we teach or preach, is to the feet of Jesus and to the feet of Jesus right here in this word and let the Holy Spirit teach us as well. And then I think a very important trait for a teacher is when we're wrong and when we mess up, because James says, you're going to mess up, you're going to say something wrong sometime, admit it and share it. I remember a time we were doing a study just a few years back and uh, a lady in the Bible study group asked me a question, and it was just, it really wasn't over the main part of what we were studying, but she was asking about the different temples in the Old Testament. And I'll be honest with you, she asked a question, you ever do this? And, and, and then I shot the answer off my hip, you know, just gave her one of those hip answers. And, 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 and as soon as I said it, I began to think, I'm not sure if that was right. When we finished the class, and so I thought, I've got to go back and dig. I'm not sure if I was right about that. And I went back, and sure enough, I was absolutely wrong about that. And I could not wait till the next week <laughs> to correct that, not at least with this lady. And so I got on my phone, and I told her simply, I said, you know, I was absolutely wrong about that. And I've studied, and here, here's what you were asking about. And then I said, you know what, next week in class, they're all going to hear the same thing <laughs> as well. And I think that's something about just teaching as well. We're, we're not always going to be right. But, but James has said, just be serious about it and be serious in the world. It's interesting in the context of the teaching, then he says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he or she says, he's perfect and can keep his whole body in check. And, and part of that, why does he say that regarding preaching or teaching? Because basically the main the way I get the message out from my heart and mind is I use my mouth and I teach in that way. Now, we also have teachers who write, and we get things out through writing as well. But that's why he says it, and that's why we have to be so careful. And then he goes on to say, there's a powerful influence of the tongue that can be either positive or negative. And I think this goes to me beyond if one's a preacher or a teacher, that there's this incredible influence that we all have with these tongues. And he says, this is how influential the tongue is when we put bits into the mouth of Horses, that little bitty bit that can take a horse that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example, although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by that little small rudder. How in the world can that small rudder steer tons and tons and I guess hundreds of tons, thousands of tons of a ship? But it does, and it can and James is saying, folks, we got to be understanding how influential our tongues are. Our tongues might be small compared to the rest of our bodies, but boy, they can control destinies. Think about it. The tongue has such great influence, positive or negative. 
the powerful influence, whether it comes from uh, someone in the church or school teachers or parents or grandparents or whoever it might be. Elijah Cummins is Maryland's 7th District Representative. He has actually been a representative of that district into the decades now, man close to his 70s. And he was going back to his home university to do a speech at an education leadership summit. And I want to tell you the words that he shared to, to educators that were there on that day. He said, this morning as I drove through the South Baltimore traffic toward I-95 in Washington, I passed near the elementary school that I attended nearly 40 years ago. Now, this was several years back. It would be much more than that. I spent most of my elementary school training as an unhappy member of what was called the third group, what we today call special education. To this day, I remember the cold, incredulous, rejecting words of my sixth grade counselor. You want to be a lawyer? Who do you think you are? And he emphasizes that. When I think back to that time, I do something I've done every morning of my adult life. I thank God for the wonderful adults who gave me my head start in life. I thank God for Mr. Hollis Posey, the sixth grade teacher who listened to my dreams, who believed in my potential as a human being, and who taught to my strengths and my limit, not my limitations. And I thank God for my parents who convinced me that I could become whatever I decided to be. I made it out of third group. I graduated second in my high school class from Baltimore City High School. I graduated from Harvard University and became a lawyer at the University of Maryland and speaker pro tem of the Maryland House of Delegates and served the people of Baltimore as a member of Congress of the United States. But in that story, it's a story I've shared often, we see the two different influences of someone who might say, as a counselor, who do you think you are? How in the world do you think you could become? Something like that. Or to the words from a Mr. Hollis Posey that were encouraging the strengths of this man or the parents. And I'm thankful for Elijah Cummings that he had a, a pretty good balance. He got some of the negative stuff, but I'm thankful that he had folks surrounding him that were using these tongues to encourage as well. So our tongues, folks, how we use them could either be negative or positive. And then James, as he goes on through this passage, you'll notice about him, though, he's not going to let us off the hook, man. He, you know, we can talk about the influence either way, and we can steer ships through rudders and all those kind of things, but pretty much the rest of the passage, he wants us to be mindful of how destructive our tongues can be. He's just not going to get off of that because he knows human nature. He knows us. And so he says these words, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. Uh, we experienced that in a very negative way. Was it about two years ago, three years ago in Gatlinburg when two boys flicking matches? Flicking matches, just having fun. And the great spark, the loss of life, the loss of many animals and, and homes and so forth. Just one little spark. And that's what James is saying. And then he says the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. I, he doesn't mince words. I'm reading just the word. He's wanting us to realize the destruction that critical words, negative words, gossiping words can have. Our tongues can destroy. They can destroy the spirit of the child. For those who were here at Celebrate Recovery, uh, Sunday night, and he doesn't mind me sharing this, Dennis Price, the associate for Russell Springs, came and shared his uh, inventory. He shared his inventory. He started preaching a little too. But there's something that he said, and as he went through his inventory, and some, something that got him kind of going the wrong way. You know, for, the, for kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, he had some really good teachers, <laughs> really good. He enjoyed school. And then fourth grade, 
He had a lady, he said, who was not only just tough, she was just mean-spirited and so forth. And, and, and the first time I heard him tell his inventory, uh, he actually mentioned the name of the teacher. He's from Burksville too, which is where my wife's from. And I recognized the name because <laughs> my wife and her twin sister, who were honor students, they graduated way high in their class, struggled with the same lady. And she was just vindictive and would humiliate kids in public. And, and you saw from Dennis, it started him down a track of not caring about school and not liking school and those kind of things as well. I mean, man, it, it's huge. Our tongues can destroy reputations. 18-year-old uh, Zoe uh, had to enroll in a new school, senior year. When she got into the new school, she met a young man very shy. <laughs> and within a few months, they were, they were dating. It was good dating. Wholesome, I'll say it this way, wholesome dating relationship. But someone in the school started a rumor that this couple, that they were doing drugs and having risky sex together. Wasn't true, but someone just started that on campus. And this is what she writes. Zoe said, I would walk around campus and people would just call me nasty names. I got called to the principal's office because they believed the rumors. And so they called my parents. And my parents were horrified. And my parents believed the rumors, she said. And my parents sent me to a therapist. And the therapist believed the rumors. No one ever listened to her story. And the therapist gave me all kinds of literatures on drugs and all those kind of things. And she writes these words. I felt that I had no control over anything anyone said about me, said Zoe, who spent many hours crying in her room. Not only are you alone, but nobody will listen to you as well. And I want to tell you, just like those boys that had that flick of a match, someone just literally made up something. And it could destroy a reputation very quickly. James is real clear. The source of this kind of talk, he said, its origin comes from the devil himself. That's why he mentions hell in this passage. Um, Proverbs 16, 28 says, A perverse man, woman, stirs up dissension, and a gossip separates close friends. Um, I was reading an article about uh, 50 different things that will, it, I think it was called, uh, and this was just a, uh, it wasn't any kind of religious article or anything, but um, it was the 50 different things that are totally different now because of the internet. You know, things you won't see people do anymore, those kind of things. A lot of things, just basic kind of things. But one of them was this, number one, the art of the polite disagreement. God, <laughs> the art of the polite disagreement. Or we can disagree and we can talk about this and, and we can work through this or whatever. It's just gone. Man, we, we have something called rants now. And we might not be saying them, but we're using this <laughs> just as bad. And so James finally says to all of us, and I say we and all of this for guilty, 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 saying stupid stuff from my lips. The impossibility of the tongue to be tamed by our human strength. And, and he gives, you know, what I like about James, they're just simple and they're clear. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. Now you think about that. Do we tame wild lions and, and they can make them do any, all kinds of tricks? We tame killer whales. <laughs> My goodness. And somebody down at SeaWorld makes a whole lot of money. <laughs> for all of us to come to. That was kind of a joke, but uh, that was just a little tension, but anyway, just break it through. But if you think about that, a killer whale, which we realize sometimes isn't so trained, but, you know, horses and elephants, and but this little tongue must come under the control of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And while he talks about the burning here in a bad sense of how gossip and stuff can man, it can, man, it's like a fire roaring out of control. There was a good fire in Acts chapter 2. It was called Pentecost. And that was the fire of the Holy Spirit that comes and cleanses and that filling of the Holy Spirit. Beth Moore writes, the human tongue can be lit 
by either source, heaven or hell. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And again, I say the more we get this in the heart, the more we get that the love of Christ in our heart, that's what will be spoken. Proverbs 16, 23 says, A wise man's heart or a wise woman's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. And this is Psalm 140, 1, 3. I want to close with this. It's a psalm, but I think it's a prayer psalm. And it simply says this, Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips of my lips, and boy, I need to say that. Now, I might need to pray that. What, there one time a day, maybe? Maybe, maybe 10 or 15 or 20. Two, at least two. <laughs> no, we, that's a wonderful prayer. And it's tough, but we can. And, and I'm convinced the more, you know, we used to say in computer, you know, I started doing com computers in junior college in 1979, 80, and you know, anybody remember that when you had to go and punch the little holes in the cards, you know? You kids are so fortunate today. <laughs> Made one bad punch, you had to start over, you know, but binary and all that kind of stuff. But I just remember there was that common thing, garbage in, garbage out. And often that's what happens in our life. It's very simple, but, but it's truth. And so, James, I think God speaks to all of us today. We're going to have our closing uh, song, and um, as, we, uh, as the praise team comes to lead us, this altar is open, and it's always open for any need. Um, I think something that Celebrate Recovery uh, has continued to teach me, we're, we're talking about something we're struggling kind of with inventory, you know, but there's something called daily inventory in which I just do a check on my own life. And when I know I've probably harmed somebody, something with something I've said, I, I try to make amends quick on that kind of thing, whether it's a phone call, maybe it's to go by to see someone, uh, just to simply say the words, I'm sorry, and those kind of things. Sometimes that's what we need to do as well. Uh, if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, I invite you to come as well. But any other prayer concerns as we stand and sing.